So welcome to uh, Not Your Grimdark Dystopia. This is Optimism in Sci-Fi and Fantasy. I am joined by S.L. Dove Cooper, Callan Nen uh, Nenov, for, uh, Fadi Fabio Fernandez and Francesco Frizzo. I'll have them say their names correctly because I no doubt butchered it. Uh, my name is Paul Carroll. I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, so today's panel is going to be looking at generally hope punk and solar punk um, and what we do for society and the environment and issues of injustice and inequality. Uh, so I'll let my panelists introduce themselves. Um, Cal, if you want to go first. Thank you. Um, I'm Karlin Nenov, but please call me Cal. Um, I'm a member of a volunteer community called the Human Library. Um, we've been preparing, publishing, and promoting books that look at what um, human means and also um, how can we expand the definition? What is a more grown up version of humanity? Um, Francesco? Hello, hello, hi. Um, my name is Francesco Verso. I'm, I'm a science fiction writer uh, and editor of uh, Future Fiction. Um, I'm currently based in Rome. Um, I've been contributing to the uh, solar punk in many ways. I've been writing probably the first uh, European uh, solar punk novel, and I've uh, edited together with this guy here, Fabio Fernandes, uh, one of the first uh, international uh, solar punk anthologies with translation from uh, six countries, six languages, and probably 10 different countries. And uh, we uh, published on Future Fiction another anthology of international solar punk called From Desperation to Strategy. And so I've been uh, advocating this merging genre uh, in Italy, in Europe, and also I brought it to uh, China in a number of conventions. And one of these anthology is going to be published in Chinese uh, next year. So um, I. I, I really believe that solar punk is uh, one of the most um, interesting uh, movement at the moment and something that science fiction writers should really look into. Cool. Uh, Fabio, if you want to follow up on that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Fabio Fernandes. I I'm come from Brazil, but I'm currently also based in Rome. It's been one month now today. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a science fiction writer. I write in Portuguese and in English. And as Francesco uh, already told you, uh, we co-edited together uh, one of the first solar punk uh, European anthologies. And I also had the pleasure of translating uh, the, the solar punk, Brazilian solar punk anthology, which has been widely considered the first global uh, solar punk anthology ever. Uh, currently, uh, I'm writing uh, many kinds of stories, solar punk among them. I have this collection uh, uh, published uh, by Luna Press in March called Love on Archaeology, which has all sorts of stories in them, uh, but most of them uh, are tend not to be green dark. In, in fact, green dark is something uh, which I abhor, and I, I really can't can't wait for us all to move from these kind of scenarios, and that's why I'm uh, joined Francesco in the solar punk experience, so to speak, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, see what uh, what the future brings to us in that respect. Thank you, and uh, last but not least, Salt of Cooper. Hi, um, I'm Sal Dov Cooper, um, or Lynn, or Dov, whichever. And um, I am a fantasy and science fiction writer. As a writer, I'm actually a little bit intimidated by solo punk and hell punk. <laughs> but as a reader, I really, really enjoy them. And uh, like Fabio, I'm really tired of the grimdark stories. And I just love this shift that we're seeing towards more optimistic stories. And I'm just really excited about that and about seeing where that can go. Right, so um, I guess the, the first question you have to ask is what makes something hope punk or solar punk? Um, are they different subgenres? And can something be both? 
I don't know who wants to start with that. Yeah, I mean, if I can start uh, the, I think hope is a, a, a term that is too vague, too, you know, general. You can apply it, uh, hope, hope, hopefulness to basically anything. Um, and uh, um, I don't see hope uh, punk as a platform of any uh, political or social or industrial or economical uh, transformation. I, I, at the moment, I'm, at least, I'm not aware of. While, while on solar punk, there is a, a, a full um, and almost completely developed platform of um, uh, understanding a possible transition to the current dystopian time we're living to a possible um, uh, better future or not so green dark, of course. So I see uh, solar punk as um, a more um, comprehensive and understandable uh, term, um, even though, of course, it, it, there is not a clear definition. But when it comes to a comparison with hope punk, uh, I think it, it stands up uh, much better on its own uh, legs. Uh, if I may add something to what Francesco just said, uh, I agree with him. I, I, I can't, I, I couldn't be, I wouldn't be able to tell you about any hope punk works because I, I really don't know what hope punk is. I think uh, if there is any uh, palpable difference, is that uh, for me is it's in the word logistic. I think uh, I think of solar punk as I what I call in academia uh, a logistic utopia. Uh, There's a kind of utopia that is, does not have anything to do with the, the, the earlier utopias of the 20th century, but something that you can build again now. I think, I think the, the, the writer that uh, most uh, called this to my attention was King Stanley Robinson, especially this, his later works like Aurora and New York, 2140. Uh, and I, I, I started to, to see himself as a kind of guide, guideline to what we could and should be doing with uh, solar punk. I think hope punk is all well and good, but uh, I really can't see uh, the point in it uh, politically because it's another thing I've been insisting too much with my friends, particularly on Brazil. I think it's political. It doesn't have to be flag carrying, and, but uh, not a political party related, but it's, it's uh, it, begs us to uh, take action against something. If this, we are living in, as Francesco again put it very well with air quotes, uh, uh, dystopian times right now, because I, I do believe we really shouldn't call our times dystopian because that is uh, too much of an embellishment. We are <laughs> living so much worse a situation right now than a mere dystopia. Because in yeah. dystopia, we have a hero. It always have you, and as the Americans are so fond of teaching us, there has to be one single hero. <laughs> and some guys, okay, you can have a heroine in, in, in uh, um, Hunger Games, for instance, but we know that is not true. That's not going to happen. So, uh, these dire times require uh, really serious. Uh, solutions and I think solar punk is just in its early years but it's already given us uh, a few blueprints on how to act as a collective that's uh, it's interesting that you you approach it from the, the politic of it because my, my experience of how punk the definition that I got from it was actually it was from Tumblr post years ago um, it's what I sent to my writing group and it's literally uh, having my phone here. The opposite of grimdark is hope punk. Pass it on. That was the post, <laughs> and so that was that was the, that was the whole, that was the entire approach for the, for the genre. Something um, optimistic and upbeat. So I guess uh, the genre didn't really start with a politic in mind. Can I can I jump in here? Of course. Uh, because for me, uh, one of the quintessential hope punk uh, novels that I've read is A Chameleon Moon, Moon by Rowena Silva. And um, the difference for me between um, their whole punk uh, story and the solar punk I've read is very much a difference in focus. Um, for me, solar punk seems to be very focused on 
uh, especially environmental solutions, whereas Hope Punk is very much more about dealing with um, regimes that we have right now and for marginalized people to come together as a community. Um, whereas solar punk is has that community already kind of built in. Um, I'm not sure if that makes any sense to anybody but me, but I hope so. Yeah, I I, I can see the point on that um, because I think solar punk is built on the basis that the world has changed a bit. Not 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 necessarily. I I I, I but I, I I do agree with Dov because. Uh, Hope punk is. I think it's. I, I can see it clearly now. Uh, you are dealing with with today, but we don't. Uh, I don't see it as having uh, this um, ecological approach, for instance. Yeah, and the, the name doesn't... solar punk. The name solar punk already lends itself to that mm -hmm. notion. We mm -hmm. we try to uh, to reach in uh, sustainable options, life options, and hope punk can be virtually anything that is against. Green dark, which is not a, a bad thing, mind you, but uh, but I, I think solar punk is more interesting uh, to to me to me. I can only speak for me in writing because uh, hope punk can be virtually everything, and solar punk. Okay, how do I approach this uh, logistically by this the means of uh, uh, climate change, for instance? But by climate change, you can slowly tackle everything. That's what uh, KSR's books are about. Usually the, he starts talking about how to build a new ecology, but he talks about everything, about social, uh, social issues, about political, about economical issues. That thing's interesting me a lot. And I think if you are writing about right now and the near future, I, we, we don't have any other way, right? We don't have any other, we can't help writing about this. I'm sorry. I think, I think that's a very, very fair distinction between Hope Punk and Solar Punk as well. But so Hope and Lala. Solar Punk is just uh, slightly just broader because it has a different base. So it, it, it can expand in different directions. Uh, whereas Hope Punk is very much about, at least for me, is very much about um, building up uh, the foundation for Solar Punk to be developed in those settings, kind of. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that seems interesting to me. I think, I think, I think it's your right. I, I, I would like to ask something. I mean, how do you put together the term hope with the nihilistic, cynical, disillusioned term punk? That's I don't uh, know. a kind of <laughs> thing that that's is That's tricky. That's tricky. I mean, yeah, it's really tricky. <laughs> Uh, my my understanding, and as uh, Cal has an answer for this, um, is that the punk element of hope punk hope comes from so. <laughs> it comes from the the resilience and the the the, the fight against the oppression. Um, so it's 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 the punk it's the punk element of it is is literally the fight against what's wrong with the world in whatever way the story is set. Um, so it's fighting against the establishment, which is the way most punk genres tend to be built. Or at least the early ones were, um, and then obviously you, you throw in the optimistic side of things. Um, there's a question we came up with when we were doing our, our little notes: uh, Is there a difference between a utopia and an optimistic approach for the future? I'm not sure I understand at all the question, because <laughs> there's not a thing about being this more important than that. Things are joined together. Uh, the ideas express themselves through the politics, through the economic settings. It's a scenario. We live in a political scenario that is this and this, and then you act on it. So uh, I don't see any limitation to that. Again, every time I, I, I this, is, this is a funny thing. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, Dylan meant that, but every time I talk about politics in a panel, people think I am or a card-carrying communist, which I'm not because uh, I don't feel like it, but I could be a card-carrying communist. But uh, I'm not talking about party politics here. 
Uh, yeah. The other day, I was talking to a person in Twitter, a very intelligent, very smart uh, person about capitalism. And I was talking about politics, and, and this person told me, well, no, capitalism has nothing to do with politics. It's just power. <laughs> and I told the person, and what do you mean by that? By power, Powers, power happens in, in the void alone? Who helps power? Oh, okay, enterprise, uh, com big companies. No? Cyberpunk, for instance, uh, usually also meant the, 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 the fight of the, the hacker fighting the good fight against corporations. But uh, who makes the loss? Who profits no? from it in the corporations? Uh, there you have party politics, there you have uh, uh, governments and associations and syndicates, maybe. But uh, I, I think that the contrary is very limiting not to think on politics and economics when they're writing about a story right now in the near future. I, I dare say that even if you write a story about 300 years in, in the future, The Expanse, for instance, The Expanse has, has it all, has adventure, has noir, has super science, and has lots of politics. One of the best characters ever, uh, Varasala, uh, is a politician, for crying out loud. So uh, I'm sorry for extending myself. I would love to, 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 to listen to all, especially Cal. Cal is too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I was thinking about a story in an anthology called um, Hieroglyph. Um, sorry about my pronunciation. Stories and visions for a better future. It's called... Um, Degrees of Freedom, um, the author is Karl Schroeder, uh, and um, it deals with what we have here, a clash of definitions. Um, I can't talk about whole punk because when I was preparing for this panel uh, and I was compiling a list of all the upbeat, uplifting speculative fiction I've ever read, I came up with some 200 titles and I realized there's Supposed to be a whole pack anthology somewhere there, but now I can't find it. So I haven't read any whole punk so far. But when I was listening to you, I remember that story by Carl Schroeder because um, it deals with a particular kind of humanitarian technology. Um, it is about negotiations. Uh, and uh, in this particular future, um, there is a very smart um, expert system Uh, which tests yeah, gives gives every participant in a negotiation a test or about the way uh, they define certain concepts. For instance, when they say capitalism, do they mean something which is you know a bit more positive or a bit more negative? When they say democracy, is it the rule of the mob or is it the best system of government ever invented? And then it groups those participants according to, to the way they define those key concepts. So when the negotiation starts, it will bring together only participants alike. And in this way, it makes sure that there are no or uh, fewer arguments based on definitions. People who understand each other better negotiate on one point, people who understand each other better negotiate on another point. But in this way, We, uh, we can cut down on, on all of these definition arguments and um, uh, uh, talking about the same thing with different words or talking about completely different words using the same thing, what is called bypassing in communication studies. This is probably one of the, the most important uh, problems of communication. So, yeah, um, so Orpunk uh, actually offers some solutions to, to what we are having right now. I don't know if this is... Uh, Uh, related to politics or economics, but it's foundational. It's really fundamental if we are to understand each other better. So if you can find the story, uh, I will uh, post the links on the Discord channel later. Uh, I highly recommend it. Thank you. And it was nice to hear from you. <laughs> we've, we've got some, some chatty people on the panel, which is good, because it means I don't have to do quite as much talking. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the chat, which I'll, I'll put in before we move on, the prepared notes. Um, so one person, I'm not getting names here, uh, they asked, 
uh, wouldn't you say that without hope now, you can't have hopeful futures? Uh, because it feels like we're living in a near dystopia right now. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to take that. Oh, I get it first then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are so organized. Um, I, I would say that um, you definitely need um, some level of hope to imagine hopeful futures. Um, although sometimes you can just try and imagine a hopeful future just out of spite. <laughs> As I think that's what some, some people I know do is they, they're like, you know, right now sucks. I'm just going to imagine something better. And maybe if we get enough people reading it and believing in it, we'll make it happen. Aggressive optimism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that works. Uh, Kali, do you have a point to add to that as well? Um, I was wondering about the other side of this question um, are there actually people out there here in our audience or maybe somebody on the panel who doesn't have hope Ooh, that's getting dark that's good that's leading into grim dark <laughs> but that's the point that's the point it's too general you can of course, you need punk. You need uh, hope uh, to get up every day. Uh, sometimes you have more. Sometimes you have less. But without it, um, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. No. So uh, um, shall we call it air air punk or food punk or energy punk? I mean, <laughs> it's a layer that doesn't really uh, help you to address how shall we do it. And the other way, solar punk is not. A hopeful thinking is an exit strategy with tools, with pragmatism, with a, an actual uh, political agenda or environmental agenda or uh, energetic agenda or individual agenda. It has a toolkit to actually start today, not postpone this feeling of hopefulness onto imaginary scenarios onto future generations we don't have time the, the 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 climate change is not a climate change anymore it's a climate emergency so the time is up <laughs> it's time to act and we do it with words that have a meaningful and a direct relation to the life to the to the life we we have to to the community we 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 gather around um, we use the pandemic in, in a, in a counterintuitive way. Um, for example, Fabio and myself, we organized a future con last year when there was no way to get together and the network was used in a hopeful way. No, it was used in a real practical way to give access to people that were never being invited to a convention online uh, because of the visa, because of the travel cost, because of the of so I consider this a kind of you know punk strategy, okay? Uh, but just to say that uh, the 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 tools are there. We need to use them, and that's what Solar Punk tries to um, to 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 um, put in place. Really put in place, creating the building blocks of this path, not just you know the um, the fantasies. Uh, just to add one thing, uh, uh, I totally agree with him, but uh, saying this, uh, we are right now, uh, the solar punk, uh, my opinion, is taking the cyberpunk and the steampunk one step ahead because it's all the, the, where the, the, does the punk fit? It's in the do it yourself. Uh, in, in, in cyberpunk times, in the 80s or 90s, you couldn't do this very much. You do this musically. We are still in the post-punk phase. Uh, in steampunk, uh, I, 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 I met many, many members of the, 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 the cyber, the steampunk, Brazilian steampunk association. They have, they, they, they are a very big association and most of them l try to leave the, the steampunk style doing, uh, doing it themselves, including uh, sealing their own clothes. And, and this, this is an awesome thing. And in solar punk right now, 
we are st starting to do the same thing with a different toolkit. And I think this toolkit is more organized, not exactly in the in making, uh, I, I, uh, we can do, we can do something uh, really uh, uh, across the board, but uh, we are uh, creating strategies. We are trying to unite people here and now to uh, not only to write, but to create better solutions now. Uh, Francesco. I, I wanted to add something that maybe is insightful. Maybe you, you tell me. Um, I think hope is an heteronymous term in the sense that hope depends on conditions that are outside of yourself. Um, while solar punk is an autonomous term in the sense that, as Fabio said, do it yourself, but not yourself as a single person, but yourself as a community. I mean, it could start from yourself as an example, but that is just the first step to gather energies along the way. So um, it is, it, it, it is a, a something that you take the future into your own hands. Otherwise, it's an, it, you know, it, it goes into the, op the openness, which is fine, which is totally fine. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a positive feeling, it's, a, it's, an, it's an optimistic attitude, uh, but that's not enough, I think. Do you think maybe the difference might be that Hope Punk is fighting against something, whereas Solar Punk tends to be fighting for something? Could be, yeah. Could, could be, it, yeah. It, yeah. I think it's also maybe um, linking back to what I said about Hope Punk sometimes being like the foundation where Solar Punk can build on, is um, sometimes some people need to have that personal vision of, I can have hope. I can have life, I can be accepted in society before they can make that step towards coming together and doing, you know, joining with solar punk and the, the entire community and working out how they can build it. Sometimes first you have to build on yourself before you can join in with the community. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point where you can use one to step into the other. Yeah. Um, which kind of leads on to my next question then. How how can you use storytelling to promote provoke empathy and to engage people in large scale issues? So like if if you if you've already come with the, the element of hope or optimism and the determination for solar punk, or if you're trying to instill that into an audience through hope punk, how do you do that? Oh, I have another another good example here. Uh, currently, I'm reading a series by uh, Rachel Aaron called uh, Heart Strikers. Uh, it is um, urban fantasy. Do I hear any screams? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, and it's about dragons. No screams again? Strange. Very tall screams, people okay. on this panel. <laughs> Uh, um, actually, what I uh, love about it is that it's a, it is a fiction manual for peacekeepers and conflict mediators. Basically, we have a, a protagonist who is the weakest dragon ever born uh, and who also wants to do things nicely, unlike all his sisters and brothers uh, who are very scheming, um, ruthless, and so on. Uh, and uh, um, you have one difficult situation after another, and they get progressively more difficult with more players involved. The UN, yeah, it sits in the near future. Uh, um, the UN, the, something coming from an extra planar dimension, uh, and uh, everything. Uh, is solved with the power of words, plain old words, no telepathy, no mind bending, stretching, twist, tuning, whatever, um, just um, mm, diplomacy or mediation or conflict transformation, whatever you want to call it. And you don't really, it, it doesn't matter that you have dragons in this book, they could be aliens or they could be just you and me. But it's, it's people who are trying to understand um, everybody's side 
and um, um, and come up with a lasting solution that will leave everybody as satisfied as possible, which is one of the foundations of conflict transformation. Um, so um, this book uh, could have been a textbook, right? It could have listed the same principles and methods and we would have read it and yawned and forgotten half of it on the next day and so on. But now I have lived with it for almost a month. It's about 2,000 2, pages, the, the whole series. And uh, uh, I have lived with the, the characters through all their um, trials and tribulations. And, and so I think this is, this is one way that fiction really works. Um, we, we get to be those people or dragons or vampires or whatever. Uh, and uh, we get to feel their triumphs and their losses and the way they are um, uh, approached by the author is um, the mark that will be left on us as a readers. I have grown up into what I am right now um, in, in a large part due to, to books like uh, Michael Endes, The Neverending Story or, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention a, a couple of others towards the end of this panel. Uh, so I think this applies to, to other people too, like to, to really keen readers. They take books, they live with them. And so if we write our stories uh, in a way that shows people better ways to be, um, the, the impact is stays. It, it's, it's there to stay. That's really nice. I know some people in the audience will approve of the dragons. <laughs> Um, how does Solarpunk do this, do you think, uh, Fabio or Francesco? Um, does, it, does it provide a manual for people to start addressing things? You would want to go or shall I go? All right. Well, no, please go. it doesn't have to be so, you know, like a, a, a manual. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> otherwise, it gets a bit, you know, I think. Uh, but let's say that uh, storytelling can be inspiring. In 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 this this book uh, that was the best of world science fiction, edited by Lavi Tidar, I wrote a story about um, migrant people uh, that from the north of Africa are coming to Italy. It's a huge uh, problem we have every single day over. I mean, just just to if if we want to cut it, but just the last you know, 20 years, but it goes back <laughs> a long time ago. But anyway, the, the thing is that these people are being rejected by by, by European community with a, a 3D printed wall on the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea and they surveilled by drones. And what happens there is a, a huge uh, carrier ship that takes them to an, an island which is just being born after an eruption and they kind of 3D print uh, an island. They use the magma like just like the Dutch used to use to create the, the polders, and they create a land for these people. So using huge 3D printers, they 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 create this this polderization of, of this 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 place. And um, it is a way to show that do we really need to have this kind of policy? Uh, on migration, do we really have to, you know, divide the land with these nonsense borders and these passports and these visas, where the the, the history of mankind is a history of migrations? Everybody is a migrant in every single part of the world. So, as a way to show that science fiction can tell a story of biopolitics biopolitics because we are dealing with the lives of people through the regulation and the laws and that's what i think science fiction does um do, do you have anything to add to that about nope. storytelling nope nope <laughs> that's okay just didn't want to leave you out <laughs> uh, so my, my next question was entirely focused on hope punk because i think we we anticipated more hope punk in the conversation, but what? Suppose I'll rephrase it and then what draws you to solar punk um, or to hope punk, whichever genre you tend to gravitate towards? Um, where do you think the desire for it comes from? 
Is that for me in the first time or? Uh, you can start, yeah. <laughs> okay, because I, I like both of them. Um, I probably made it clear that I think they're closely related. <laughs> Yep. Um, but for me, what draws me to both of them is um, the optimism and, you know, the promise that if we work towards it, we can make the entire world better. We can make our human communities better. We can make our relationship with nature better. It's, it's just um, that level of optimism is something that is just missing in a lot of other genres. And it's something that really draws me in. Seeing uh, nodding heads. <laughs> um, uh, oh, yeah, sir, go on. Oh, 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 oh. I'd like to say, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, I, 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 as as, as uh, Colin was saying uh, before, I think we pretty, most, uh, uh, pretty mostly agree with each other in many points, just uh, adding small things to, to the mix. Um, that said, I think that's yes. Uh, I also would like to be uh, to this optimism blowing. But um, I, I, I'm really that. That's an interesting thing. I'm really not a, not an optimistic guy. I'm I'm a very pessimistic one. But uh, I I don't like to uh, make things worse in my fiction. I'm not all for. Uh, Utopia in my stories, but I really like to 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 see um, the small steps, the small things we can do in, on a daily basis. Because uh, while uh, Carl was to talking, the, 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 telling about the mega story he was reading, he is reading too. I I couldn't uh, help remembering the last novel written by Damon Knight, which was called Why Do Birds. It was a kind of apocalyptic story. And uh, he, uh, the, 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 there is a guy, this guy who, who I can't remember his name. I read it many years ago. And uh, this guy uh, pretty much uh, tried to design a kind of spaceship uh, to take back, uh, to take away from Earth uh, more than a million people. It was kind of an alien uh, design. But here's the thing, uh, it's, uh, at the halfway through the story, it became super science. He got a, 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 a kind of magic ring, and whenever he shook hands with any, anyone, uh, this peop the, the, the person he shook hands with automatically believed every single word he said. So if he uh, shook, uh, I shook your hand, I say, come with me if you want to leave. He would go. Right now, it, it's a, it's a very good story. It's not it's not a bad story, but it's almost fantasy. And even though I would love this thing to happen, uh, this thing do not happen. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, the benegesserites are doing. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but but uh, yes, but uh, uh, if you are talking about Dune, for instance, uh, there's <laughs> all sorts of uh, political manipulations there oh, in the yeah. story. Uh, they have a kind of super science-y way of doing things, but uh, they are ultimately politics. And uh, in this case, much about politics in the, in the, in the first half of the, the, of the talk, but uh, I would like to circumvent party politics for these things. As, as the, the, the wonderful, I think I, I can, I can uh, uh, praise good story, but uh, regarding this thing, if, if you can do it yourself by 3D printing things, that's awesome. Because, uh, for instance, in Star Trek, there's a whole, a whole branch of academia involving Star Trek that said we, uh, Star Trek is fully automated luxury communism because yeah. of the replicators. <laughs> and the replicators are the grandchildren of the 3D printers, right? So if, we, if uh, every house had a 3D printer, Things would be awesome. Uh, just another thing, another example. I, I remember right now. Um, uh, nano, uh, the story, a story by Nancy Crass called "Nano Com Comes to um, Clifford Town," uh, something like that. Uh, it's, it's a marvelous short story where uh, finally 
uh, the 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 uh, is invented, but it's too big and too expensive. So it's like a, a huge cornucopia. That's uh, that that the 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 mayor of the of the uh, Clifford Falls, that's American city. He puts in right in the middle of the square and say everybody can go there and ask whatever you want to the replicator, and it will give you whatever from a, a small device to a house. And okay, everything is going okay until a certain point, of, of course, because of the greediness of the people, things start to 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 to, to break apart, and the, the machine eventually breaks. But uh, uh, here's uh, another thing. It's, it's very, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good story it's for us to think that's about. That's a fable from Pushkin. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, but uh, uh, I, I was thinking, uh, yes, I, I, I was thinking of something uh, right, uh, not, not, not quite straight, like monkey's paw, for instance. But uh, be careful what we, we wish for. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, these are very, um, very good stories, cautionary tales, we could yeah. speak. But again, uh, we should try to do things collectively. In this, way. This, this optimism can't come from one person alone. We should strive to do more. But every time people gather into a collective, usually there is an elite, the 1% that says, oh, you were... You are evil. You are being communist or things like that. And you can't. You don't even have to be communist to get into collective and say, "Okay, let's do this. Let's let's uh, do do good things to each other." And I think that's that might be an utopia more than we want to believe. But again, I'm I'm blabbering. <laughs> it's fine. Um... It's actually, it's it, when I was looking up Hope Punk months and months ago before this panel even existed, one of the, the genre examples that came out of it was The Good Place, where the whole point is to do good things, and that's how you're supposed to end up in The Good Place. So I think that that is an interesting point to end on. That, uh, you know, if, if that's what Solar Punk is about as well, maybe the two aren't quite so different, but they differ in their approaches, I think. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Yes, Scott? Um, well, because we at the Human Library are looking at the next stage of think, things, I would like to, to look at the next stages of solar punk and whole punk. Um, when I was thinking of uh, my favorite examples of positive, uh, optimistic, speculative fiction, None of the books I came up with was solar punk. And as I said, I haven't read any whole punk yet, but I'm going to catch up on it. I'm looking at um, your table, Paul, actually. I saw that you have some whole punk, so I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, what I would like to see in solar punk and whole punk is first, um, larger scales, and second, deeper characters. So um, for that, usually you need bigger books. Um, if you just write short stories, you can explore particular solutions to particular problems, but you can't really evolve um, the relationships or community, show communities in, um, in evolution and so on. Uh, so uh, the books that I, 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 I would recommend to solar punk writers um, are... Um, um, a space opera called The Celestial Way. Um, it's uh, the debut novel by um, a Bulgarian writer using the pseudonym Drake Vato. Uh, the Celestial Way is, is really epic uh, in its scope, um, but what, um, what I uh, like about it is that it very much emphasizes the point that there's no such thing as um, bad guys. There are bad states, bad states we go through, and also lots of misunderstandings. Um, the other book, which Fabio knows about, uh, is uh, a trilogy called uh, a Requiem for Homo Sapiens by David Zindel. Um, it's, uh, it has a very humble, very modest protagonist um, with very little dreams, like this guy um, wants to um, cure an incurable disease. 
uh, he wants to stop um, the supernovas from exploding, like human-based disaster, a human-made disaster. And he also wants to understand every possible worldview and say yes to it so that uh, he can bring uh, the whole universe together. Um, I would like to see these kinds of stakes in solar punk stories and these kinds of ambition and uh, these kinds of scopes. Um, and I'm sure that uh, in, in a generation at most, hopefully in 10 to 15 years, we'll have them. So our punk is very young, and I think whole punk is even younger as a genre. So I'm really looking forward to the, the next version, so our punk 2.0. And maybe Francesco and Fabio will be guiding us towards that. <laughs> Uh, if I can add something to Colin, I think is that here you are facing a, a, a pure commercial problem in the sense that the big industry is uh, still uh, uh, very stubbornly um, stuck on the dystopian and on the cyberpunk. So um, they are very resistant to uh, change what sells. And because we're dealing with weak uh, signals here, uh, of course, um, you need that level of bravery, <laughs> a level of courage to invest in what doesn't really sell at the moment, because it's very easy to sell a trilogy on pandemic at the time or selling uh, a trilogy or a series on uh, cyber surveillance. You know, that's what uh, people talk about. Um, but we're not talking about that. So... I can just show you that there are books. Uh, it's just that they are not being published in English. There are big novels out there. It's just a, a matter of finding them. Um, maybe sometimes they are published by small presses. Um, when it comes to my personal suggestion, uh, I'm going to publish soon this little book by Eric Hunting, which is not fiction, but it's uh, nonfiction. Um, and is uh, called Solar Punk Design, uh, Post-Industrial Design and Aesthetics. You can find it on Medium, uh, the English version. I have translated and published it in Italian. And it's a very interesting um, exploration of how many aspects of our society can be transformed in the next uh, uh, 30 to 50 years in a matter of, uh, trans I mean, phases of transition from a, from a very soft solar punk uh, phase to a medium and a, a more consistent and deeper transformation of a sustainable society. So it goes and touches all these aspects about uh, prototyping, uh, about uh, the industry, about, about modular um, uh, objects, uh, how we, 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 we fabricate the things. Um, and it's interesting because it could give writers uh, an interesting setting uh, where and, and, and have a, a ready-made scenario where they can you know, uh, set their story. So I, I find it very interesting. Um, so we're we are coming close to the end of the panel. Um, I wonder if the men book other than one that they've worked on that is a good example of hope punk and or solar punk, um, so that people can take something away. Go look further into the genres themselves. Um, oh, I'm just I, I'm just going to add something here because. Uh, uh, the, 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 this is exactly this, the solar punk uh, and uh, Francesco already told about our solar punk anthology in Italian and I would like to recommend uh, uh, the Brazilian solar punk anthology as well. It, uh, it can, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the copy, the physical copy with me. It's, uh, it's were printed by World Weaver Press uh, and, uh, and as, as I said, uh, it's the, 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 the title is simply solar punk. And uh, it was edited by Brazilian uh, Gerson Lodge Ribeiro and myself as a translator. But uh, it, it, it has, uh, again, very different stories in scope, but at least half of them offer 
sorts of blueprints on how to deal uh, with near future in a uh, sustainable and ecological manner. Um, as out of, do you have a recommendation? Um, I am actually more into the general optimistic fiction rather than specifically whole punk or solar punk. But when it comes to solar punk, um, I think my recommendation is going to be Claudia Arsenault's Viral Airwaves, which is um, a short novel um, that is probably more solar punk aesthetic than solar punk, as we, as Francesco so expertly explained it here. But it's very much about uh, building a sustainable world and living in that sustainable world. And also with dealing with politics in that sustainable world, because having that, uh, those, um, that relationship with nature and doesn't necessarily translate into having different politics. So it deals with that as well. Great. Uh, Karen, do you have recommendations to share? After all the, the ones I already did, I've taken <laughs> too much time anyway. Thank you. <laughs> People like books at this convention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Francesco, did you have any? Well, uh, um, I'm. Um, I don't have, let's say, a particular book is again that I'm going to publish next month. Uh, it's called Andrew Dana Hudson. And I published his first uh, collection of short stories um, in Italian, but there are a number of these stories uh, spread all over the web. So I highly recommend you to read these short stories because, and I say it very straight and direct here, uh, when I read these stories, I had the same uh, cognitive estrangement to say a very a specific uh, term in science fiction that I had when I read uh, uh, Burning Chrome. Okay, so this is a huge uh, uh, statement because I think he can uh, see the issues of our next 30 and 40 years when it comes to political communities, when it comes to uh, off-grid uh, solution, when it comes to sustainable um, development uh, when it comes to um, algorithm biases, uh, all these things that are going to insist on the very tissue of our uh, near future time. And that requires imagination to understand what would be the next big thing. And I think he nailed it really well. <laughs> Carol and if our panel would like to do their final plugs before we tidy up, I don't uh, know if anyone to push. <laughs> Paul, are, are you going to, to give us your recommendations? Oh, I I am not hugely re uh, read in Hope Punk and Solar Punk. I mostly get them from uh, movies and television, which is um, <laughs> it's a lot more casual. Um, like I I. I love the, uh, like, now these are just examples that were kind of posited by the genre, like, genre fiction writers um, for, like, newspapers. They were trying to get people to just latch onto a, t a term. Um, but Pacific Rim, even though it's not a great science fiction movie, was a great example of Hope Punk because it was fighting for the sake of the fight and rather than giving up, um, even if it was kind of against impossible odds. And the good place is my uh, it's, it's my happy place to go to. 